The following is a reading from Fairy Folk Tales of the Maori by James Cowan. This version is a second-hand retelling of the story and should not be considered authoritative. Furthermore, many images in this video are not accurate representations of Maori material culture, figures either historical or mythical, or places and events. This version of the story should be considered to be inferior to all versions transmitted through traditional oral history. The seaside village of the Nati Awa tribe at Fakatane is set on a green bank between cliff and tideway, looking to the sand dunes and the river mouth where the Bay of Plenty rollers tumble on the bar. Behind the kainga of neat Pakeha-style cottages surrounded by fruit groves, the dark volcanic heights go up in a straight wall, crowned with ancient forts where grand old Pahutukawa trees stand tenaciously rooted in the trenches and on the very verge of the precipice. On the beach, there lie two or three long Totara canoes, the village fishing fleet. Tafare o Toroa, as the hamlet is called, has its carved communal meeting house, without which no Maori settlement is complete or presentable. And a sightly hall it is, this decorative house, Wairaka, facing the grassy marae or parade ground. On one of its amomahi, the upright slab supporting the front gable, a mermaid is figured, carved, a deified ancestress with proud tattooed face her hands upraised, grasping her glossy black plaits of hair. A shapely woman above the waist, fish scaled below, with her tail as gracefully curled as any mermaid's of old world poetic fancy. She is a Meraki Hau, an ocean deity. The little village children call her Te Queen Otisi. The concept is ancient Maori, but the trail of the Pakeha is over it. The cunning artist in wood carving has given the tribal goddess a golden crown. Otherwise, she is of the Maraki Hau, which you may see adorning the fronts and the interior posts and slabs which make the village art galleries in many a settlement along the Bay of Plenty coast and in the Uruwera country. The Maraki Hau is usually a male, and this merman is figured with a long snaky tongue ending in a kind of funnel into which a fish is being sucked or scooped and a fluke tail curved like a seahorse's. And the king of all these sea, Atua, is... Tetahi Oterangi, whose presentment is seen on house fronts as far inland as Mata Atua in the heart of the Urawera Mountains. Hurunui Apanui, the old chief of Natiawa, took me into his house, Wairaka, one day to show me the pictured story of Tetahi Oterangi. It was a curious drawing, crude, yet not without artistry. On the wall plate above the side slabs, carved in relief, were depicted four war canoes crowded with warriors, and with their triangular sails set apparently passing them a sperm whale drawn to the life with its great straight up and down head like a cliff. Upon its back, a warlike figure defiantly dancing a haka, in one hand a whalebone mare A, in the other three blades of flax. Astern, another whale, a kind of guard of honor to the monster on which the triumphant rider of Tanefas was dancing. And this was the story of that wondrous warrior and magician told me by Hurinui as we sat on the matted veranda of Wairaka, where to Queen Otesi looked out with far, haughty gaze on the tossing waters of the bay. Out yonder on the plain, said Hurinui, nearby the present road that goes inland parallel with the river to Taneatua and Ruatoki, there lived some generations ago the wise old man Tetahi Oterangi, the first of the heavens. He was a man learned in all occult matters, a wonder worker and magician, a healer of the sick, and if need be, a slayer of man by mystic rites. He was a tohunga like that famous magician Tuhoto, whose secret appeal to the spirits of the underworld caused the Tarawera eruption. But he was not nearly so old as that ancient man when the great deed of his life was performed. He was gray and grim in appearance, yet were his physical powers not abated. And as for his mind, he was capable of performing the most amazing things by the projection of his will force through space. The ordinary people dreaded Tatahi. They beheld in him a power which could lay the evil eye on them, slay them by dreadful, withering ways, or by awful pains which would kill them in a night. The mothers called their little children into them when they beheld the Tohunga passing. The wise man lived alone in a small Raupo reed house near a peculiar great lone rock, a gray toka about ten feet high, which stood by the trail side. You may see it now, this rock, which is called Te Toka Ahumea. It is in a wire-fenced paddock close to the road, 
on the right-hand side as you go, a short distance out of the town on the way to Taniatua. Flax plants grew in the crevices of the rock. Like the big boulder, they were tapu, and the Tohunga used them in his sacred rites. The rock was his tuahu, his altar of incantations, divination, and sacrifice to the gods. No man knows what secret man-slaying ceremonies went on in the shadow of that gray old stone of power. The people among whom Tatahi lived at last took secret counsel because of their dislike of the Tohunga and resolved to be rid of his presence. They feared to shed his blood, but they could dispose of him without violence. So this was the scheme they devised. They planned a canoe expedition to Huacari, the island volcano out yonder in the Bay of Plenty, the ever-smoking, steaming, quivering island of the Ahitipua, the enchanted fires, the volcano which the Pakeha calls White Island. They gave out that they were going for the capture of mutton birds, the sooty petrels Titi and Oi, which live and breed in the cliffs on the outer rim of Fakari. They prepared their canoes, large sea-going craft with high, well-caulked topsides. They laid in their stores of food and water, for there is no drinking water on sulfurous Fakari. And when all was ready, they invited Tetahi o Terangi to join them, as the Tohunga of the expedition, to carry out the ceremonies when the first of the Titi were taken and the rites necessary for safety at sea. And so, with the Tohunga sitting in the place of honor in the stern of the largest canoe, off went the flotilla, out through the tidal channel to the river mouth, with a hundred paddles dipping and flashing to the time of a great canoe chant. Then up went the Raupo, and woven flax sails lifting the narrow vessels northward over the long, easy roll of the sea. The canoes made Wakari late in the afternoon, and the crews toiled hard, hauling the craft well up on the beach and making them fast against any possible heavy seas. Then the fowling expedition, having left some men to look after the canoes, set out in quest of the Titi. The hunters divided into parties, and it happened that several of the principal men decided to make round along the cliffs, to the northeast side of the island, and with them was Tetahi, the Tohunga and his companions, with a slave bearing a flax basket of food and taha or calabashes of water, traveled carefully, but nevertheless with some speed, along the cliff, where stunted Pohutukawa trees grew and often offered handhold in steep places. By dark they had reached a place where there was a shallow cave in the mountain side with the sea bellowing far below. They kindled torches. They sought about for the burrows in which the Titi live, in the soft, crumbling soil of the steam-sodden isle. They made up their catches of the strong-smelling petrol in readiness for carrying to the canoe bay in the morning. And then they rested for the night. Tetahi, too, had taken his birds, but as was needful, he set them apart from the others and being weary, he slept long and soundly. Tatahi was awakened by the warm sunlight streaming into his cave shelter. In a moment he was on his feet. Something was wrong. A glance told him the truth. He was deserted. His companions were not in sight. He scrambled along the cliff. He toiled back along the perilous paths. At last he came in sight of the bay and the beach. The canoes were gone. There they were, out on the ocean that blazed under the morning sun like a great burnished undulating plate. They were flying through the water under the driving impulse of two hundred strong arms. The treacherous chiefs Tetahi could see, balanced amidships. He could almost hear their time song, the measured Rite, Kote Rite, Hukare, Ka Hukare. He was alone on the desert isle, the island of terror, which he felt even now quaking under his feet while from the hollow heart of it, where the boiling lake lashed its yellow banks, there came an awful, never-ceasing roar, the horrible voice of Ruaimoko's steam fiends. Not even a drop of water did he have, for his cruel enemies had taken the calabashes with them. It was death to remain on that island of horrors with its poison waters. But the Tohunga was not without resource in even this dread extremity. A signal fire for haply other canoes other tribes on the mainland, useless thought. Who could distinguish a fire or a smoke signal on this place of a thousand steam clouds? Tetahi had other ways. Was he not a god in himself? About his waist, 
the Tohunga wore a girdle consisting of three green blades of flax, intertwined. This, though his companions had known it not, was his potent talisman, a thing of sacred mana. He had plucked those leaves from the heart of the tapu flax bush that grew in the weathered cleft of Tetoka Ahumea. Taking off the belt and untwisting the leaves, he waved it on high as he stood on the edge of the promontory, and in high, quick tones, he cried his appeal to the gods of the sea. He invoked Tangaroa and his creatures of the great deep. He called on the magic name of Tutara Kawika. He recited the ancient charms, the rhythmic chants to the spirits of ocean. And behold, the call was answered. A huge black shining shape broke water but a short distance out in the bay, a great sperm whale. From its spiracle, it blew a geyser spout of vapor with the hissing roar of one of those steam pipes on Faka'ari. A little rainbow arched its head in the misty spray of the spout jet. It raised its powerful tail and swept the flukes down and beat the water with a noise that could have been heard a mile away. The sea boiled about it with the commotion of its mighty salute to the magician who stood on the clifftop. Tetahi Oterangi quickly descended to the beach. He swam out. It was but a little way, for the island shore was steep too. Fakari is just the shell of a precipitous mountaintop. It was Tutara Kawika himself, the king of all the whales, that had answered his call. He touched the monster's side, and as he did so, Tutara Kawika gently sank. He submerged himself just under the Tohunga and rose with the man of magic seated safely on his back in the little hollow which all Tanifa have for the special purpose of carrying those who need their aid. And straightway the enchanted sperm whale turned about and headed southward for the distant shore. Its steering marked the purple double hump of Mutohora, or Whale Island, standing sentry off Fakatane Harbor mouth. And as the Tohunga, so strangely saved from the island of terrors, looked about him, he saw another whale appear. It was Tutara Kawika's attendant. It took its place astern and followed in the white wake left by the swiftly moving monster. The sails of the canoes were in sight. Tutara Kawika sped with a movement amazingly swift yet amazingly smooth through the gently heaving blue. Now the red hulls of the canoes were seen. The Tanifa flew on with a white wave spreading away on either side from his cliff-like head, rising like a black island above the foam. The Tohunga rose. He flourished his whalebone mere in one hand, his three magic flax blades in the other. He chanted a high peeling war song, the Maro o Fakatao. He beat time as though he were directing the paddles of a great canoe. The monster and his chanting chief shot past the canoes and it was but a little while before he came to the mouth of Fakatani Harbor. And there Tutara Kawika's mission ended. He stopped. The Tohunga, reciting a thanksgiving karakia, dropped from the whale's back and swam to a nearby rock, which is known as Rukupo. The Tanifa and his attendant turned about and sped northward across the bay, sounding when they reached deep waters and rising again and spouting at regular intervals as they went. The Tohunga, leaving Rukupo Rock, swam up the Fakatani estuary and landed on the beach near where this house, Wairaka, stands. Thence he traveled leisurely inland to his own abode. And after a long space, when he knew that the treacherous crews would be approaching from the canoe landing, he went to his sacred rock of power, and there, by the side of Toka Ahumea, his magic flax blades in his hands, he was sitting, regarding them with grim, silent triumph, when the men filed past along the trail. Not a word spoke they. Their hearts were filled with shame and fear. And Te Tahi o Te Rangi stayed not much longer in this land of his deceitful tribe's people. He cast the earth of the place behind him. He traveled to distant parts. He settled himself at last at Matata by the coast yonder, at the mouth of the Awa Ateatua. There, with the smoking isle on which he had been marooned ever before his eyes, out across the bay, he lived the rest of his years and died. And when he died, his spirit entered into the great deep. He became a sea god, a Meraki Hau, such as is pictured on our carved houses. And it may be that if I, Hurinui, were in trouble on the sea and were in peril of drowning, he or his whale god, Tutara Kawika, 
would come to my aid and lift my head up above the ocean and bear me to the land as Tatahi was born in the days when he was a man of this world.